the pastor asked me, and I'm so thankful he did. I appreciate that he did. He, he wanted me to minister along the, the, the line of faith for finances. And, of course, that thrills me. Because uh, I don't care who you are, you need finances. Amen. And I don't care who you are, you can always come up in your thinking Amen. regarding finances. Amen. And we, we talked about yesterday morning about understanding who you are in Christ and what belongs to you. And that rich is not what you're trying to be. Rich is who you are. That's right. That's right. And because you're rich, the things you need come to you. Because you're rich. They, things don't make you rich. If you just want a nicer house so you can impress people, you don't understand who you are. Because we don't draw our self-image from what we possess. Amen. And if you do, you show that your mind is unrenewed, you know? And so uh, I, I, I had it in my spirit to go the direction tonight because I have so many different directions I could go uh, when in ministering about prosperity and the increase of God and the supply of God. But I had it, I, I sensed in my spirit to go this particular direction. And uh, let's look again where we left off yesterday morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I don't know about you, but the word tells us that Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Isn't that right? So God isn't glorified when we don't bear much fruit. If he's glorified when we bear much fruit, then he's not glorified when we don't bear much fruit. How about bearing fruit for him in the way we think regarding finances? Because someone who thinks right regarding finances is going to fund something great. That's right. You can have a lot of money and fund something totally ridiculous with yeah. it. <laughs> you know, plant about 94 million more trees and, you know, all these kinds of things. It's, uh, it's fine, not, you know, if you don't want to destroy the environment, that's fine. But, you know, this, thing, this place burning up. But no matter how many trees you plant, all you're doing is putting kindling in the ground. That's all you're doing because this place is burning up. <laughs> Planting kindling. <laughs> take my wealth and take my take my whole goal and direction in life and plant kindling wood. <laughs> but we want listen, we want to do we want our great God deserves something great. Doesn't he deserve something great? Well, we can't do anything great for God with wrong thinking. Right? That's right. So we need to make sure we're thinking right. And I will say this, financial prosperity is the lowest form of prosperity. You understand? Because unsaved can even participate in the exchange of currency. But uh, the highest level of prosperity is love and faith and joy and peace. Because Jesus said, my peace, I give to you. I give to you. Notice. And the world doesn't have Come it. They now. cannot That's even right. exchange. Right. They cannot even participate right. in the peace yeah. and the joy. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's inaccessible to them. Yeah. But see, currency is accessible yeah. to everybody. So that's what makes it the lowest form. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But when we handle it rightly, and when we handle it with right motives yeah. that are pleasing to God, uh, then uh, God is pleased when we handle things right. And uh, as, as we said, this era needs funding. We need to think right. We need to think right. And uh, we're, we're going to need more money in this era than we did in the Word of Faith era. We're, every era is going to need more funding than the previous era because there's more people to reach. Isn't that right? I was, I was uh, well, let's read this uh, again in Second Corinthians chapter Eight and in verse nine, where we write yesterday, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Notice this rich is a flow of his grace. So this kind of rich is even off limits to the world. Because they're not a participant of the grace. You have to be a participant of the grace to have the rich that grace brings you. Now they have, they have currency, but it's not currency by grace. By grace. And that's why they have sorrow with their with their money. But the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. Why? Because ours is by grace. It's not by it's not by intellect. That's right. It's not by IQ. It's not by education. It's by grace. But just like uh, any other grace, it, remember uh, Paul would write and said that you grow in grace. You have to develop into this. And that comes through right thinking, right believing, right living, yeah. right doing. Yeah. And so uh, that, that you might be rich. And we, we talked about yesterday morning, rich is who you are at the new birth. It's not something you earn on the job. It's who you are at the new birth because it's a flow of grace. And uh, then we go on, and I, I, want to, I want to talk to you about something that God said to me, because I, uh, in, in preaching in our church, I've been pastoring there for 25 years, and I've been pastoring just a couple, just really a couple years maybe, and uh, I had been taking several weeks, and I've been teaching on prosperity. And the Spirit of God spoke to me one morning when I was getting ready to preach like the third or fourth week on prosperity. He said, uh, you're going to have to back up. And I go, what do you mean? I mean, this is a, prosperity is part of the message. It's part of what belongs to us in Christ. And he was telling me, don't go that direction. And I didn't quite understand that. And he said, you're going to have to back up preaching on prosperity because he said, you need to teach these people to walk in love first. Because until they learn to walk in love, they don't qualify for this prosperity. And when we talk about you are made rich at the new birth, this is not a blank check. Meaning you do anything you want and think you're going to have all you need. You can't go just anywhere you want and think that you're going to have a full supply. You can't just treat people any way you want. Because see, this is by grace. And if you get out from under the flow of grace... The rich dries up. <laughs> it's all, you know. And so God said to me, he said, teach them to walk in love. And Listen, you walk in love, it'll put money in your pocket. There's profit to godliness is what the word says. There's profit to godliness. So when you walk in the light of the word and when you walk in a way that's pleasing to God, it'll cause increase. There's profit that comes with godliness when you weren't even out trying to acquire things. Godliness will just pay you. It pays to be godly. I said it pays. What's godly? Like God. Pleasing to God in something. I tell you what, no amount of money, no, no, no amount of, of profession, no, no, no business that someone can have could ever pay me what my husband and I living godly in front of our children has paid because now our children are serving God and on the plan of God for their life. And see, that's the profit of godliness. You can't, you can't, oh, nothing, nothing is an exchange. And then what about your family when you are able to go because, because you're, you're right with God and because you're wanting to live pleasing to him and you, and you want to live in line with his word, you come into his presence and you lay hold of things that your family needs and your relatives need. I've prayed one, two, three, three that I know of out of death in my family. Why? Because godliness has profit. And when you learn God and how he operates, there's profit to that. There's profit to that. It pleases him. And you start getting benefits that flow. I'm not talking about godliness because we're good. I'm talking about godliness because he's good yeah. and, uh, and brought us into yeah. his goodness. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I'm not talking about earning something. I'm talking about being true to who you are. Amen. Godliness is really being true to who you are yeah. in That's him. Good. 
It's not about earning something. If I, if I do this, then God has to reward me that. No, godliness is being true to who you are in Him. Being sincere. Not just talking something and then live any way you want. You're not being true to who you are in Him. And so tonight what I had in my heart was talking about five qualifications or we could call them disqualifications <laughs> that hold you in position of prosperity to where prosperity can flow unhindered. So we just referenced the first one, walking in love. You can get up and claim you want all you want. I'm born rich in him and go out and talk ugly to your wife and you broke. That's right, that's right, that's right. You go, you're going to get broke. Because to, to say I'm rich in him, it has to line up with everything else about in him. That's good. You can't just pick and choose what parts of in him you want. <laughs> well, I want the rich part in him, but I don't want to walk in the love part in him. No, you're going to have to do that. And you can't just say I like the rich part, well, then you're going to have to like the generous part, too. Yeah. Because one thing about God is generous. You have to be in all of in Him. Amen? Yeah. In Him, He's generous. So if you're going to be like Him and God-like, you've got to be generous. Yeah. Let's see. Well, so the first thing here is love. That if you're not going to walk in love, you're, going, you're always going to struggle financially. It's going to show up in your wallet. It, it, it's, it's going to show up. Amen. If people don't walk in love, they don't. This is what God said to me. They don't qualify for Bible prosperity. Now, let, let me, and I'm not talking about earning something. I'm talking about qualifying. You know, whenever uh, they had the Olympics, they have qualifying heats. They don't get on medal for that. No medal. That just gets you on the field. You got to qualify to even get on the field. They're not putting a TV camera on somebody who doesn't even qualify. Right? You don't even qual you don't even you don't don't even talk about you know bronze, silver, gold if you don't qualify. Because that's out of your reach if you don't qualify. Isn't that right? Those those medals are only potential for those who qualify. Not those who train, wow. but those who qualify. Come on. Come on. There are a lot of them, a lot of people out there training, yeah. but they don't qualify. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They have to meet a certain yeah. standard. Yeah. I'm rich in him, but I need to qualify so that richness can flow unhindered. Okay. Now, let's talk about that. When we talk about qualifying, we could also say at this, be in position. Be in position for it. Because uh, in, in the house I, I moved out of, if I needed to get us, you know, uh, receive a phone call or make a phone call, I had to go into the office, stand next to the window at a certain angle, <laughs> lift a leg, you know. <laughs> Everything had to be just right. I, I had to be in position to get that signal. And if I decided I want to walk around, I can walk around, but I'm losing signal. When I had that cell phone, I, you know, even when I wasn't getting a signal, I still had a cell phone. I still had a carrier, AT&T or T-Mobile or Sprint or whoever the carrier is. I, still, I, don't, I didn't lose my phone. I didn't lose my carrier, but I lost my signal. If you're not going to qualify, you don't lose your, you don't lose your, your rights in him. You still, got, you still got your phone. Still got your carrier. But you've got to be in position for the things that belong to you to work. If you, if you, don't, if you step out of love, you don't lose rich in him. You're still rich in him, but it's your position so it doesn't flow. If we could say it this way, if this were, this, this center aisle right here was the flow of supply. And you say, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Well, then get in the flow right here. And you go, well, I want to stand over here, but it's not flowing there. You've got to get where it's flowing. You've got to be in position. 
Where is supply always flowing? Love. Faith worketh by love. And you need faith for your I'm rich confession to work. Amen? Amen. And so you need your faith working because you can't receive the richness of who you are without your faith working. Praise the Lord. And so uh, your faith won't work if you're not in love. And so we understand Dad Hagen used to make this statement to us. One step outside of love is sin. One step. One step. And so if you're not going to walk in love, uh, you're going to keep money from coming to you. I, I say this to my congregation. Before you fuss and fight with each other in your marriage, Ask yourself, do I have enough money to fund this strife? Because no more money's coming. Ask myself, do I currently have enough in savings to fund this? And I'm going to tell you what, no matter how much money you got, you don't have enough to fund strife. Because where's there strife and confusion? There's every evil work. You don't have enough money to fund every evil work. You don't have enough. And so when we say we're rich, we also have to, we're, we're saying a lot of other things. We have to be aware of what's connected to this flow of I'm rich. Uh, God told my husband years ago, he was in another country preaching. God woke him up about 4.30 in the morning. He said, talked to him for about two and a half hours. And one of the things he said, he said, 97% of my people are living beneath. What I provided for them. What's that mean? 97% don't qualify. There's more not qualifying than are qualifying. Because it's available to them. Belongs to them. They still got their cell phone. You know, they still got their plan. They still got their redemption plan. But the thing is, if they're not, if they're going to get out of position, it's not, no signal. Drop calls. Drop calls. Right? Yeah, and so uh, when we think about when we think about think about it, uh, remember in Acts chapter six, in in the in the days when the number of the disciples were increasing, there arose what a murmuring, and they started fussing over our widows are being neglected because of you know our race, and so they racial stuff tried to get in. And what happened, God had to deal with that because when increase comes, that's a strategy of the enemy is to cause strife. Yes. Wow. Now, yes. you have to watch that in your own home. When God starts increasing you and you start flowing in some things that faith will do for you and the word of God will do for you, there's going to come the opportunity to get in strife. Yes. Some offense or bitterness, unforget, something's going to happen. And you better, you better know that that stuff will shut down increase. It'll shut down a business. It'll shut down all kinds of supply into your life and into your home and into your family. You know, you have uh, Abraham and Lot. Remember Abraham and Lot over in Genesis? I think it's 13, isn't it? Genesis 13. And uh, they were increasing so much that there, was, uh, there arose problems and strife between the herdsmen. There were so many cattle, there wasn't enough land to support the feeding and the grazing and the watering and all of that. And so Abraham called Lot and said, uh, we're brethren. I pray let there be no strife between us. Why? Because if strife enters in, this is the, in this is the end of increase. And see, it wasn't even the Abraham and Lot to begin with. It was just their staff members. But they knew it would travel up through the ranks. And it, if the staff members are fussing, it's going to affect the head man. And so Abraham, in his spirituality, puts a stop to it. Why? Because we need increase to continue. And so he calls Lot and says, uh, we're going to put a stop to this. And so Abraham says to Lot, he said, uh, he said we, we just need to part ways which kind of gives you the idea he wondered if it could be rescued. He, did, did he have a sense that this one going to get straightened out? So, you just, so they, need, they needed to part ways. 
And he said, he said to Lot, he said, if you want the land of the right, I'll take the land of the left. You want the land of the left, I'll take the land of the right. In other words, I'll prefer you. This is what love does. When it comes to the brethren, it doesn't fight for something. It prefers the brethren, even when they're in the wrong. That's why Abraham became the father of many nations. There was something bigger in him than fighting over something. To him, peace and love was more important than winning. You see, Because to him, peace and love was winning. So he lets Lot, and notice, you can see something about Lot. He took the best for himself. He, 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 it, it, it reveals something there. And the thing is, he took it in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was just in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't even in Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is in that direction. But before long, he ended up in the city. The direction you head is the direction you're going to end up in. And notice, he's living in the city. The time that, by the time that God delivers his, him and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's living in the city. He's not living there with cattle. He got rid of cattle to live among the ungodly, but wouldn't get rid of cattle to live with his man of God. He should have stayed with his man of God. You see. And, uh, and so... Anyways. And the Bible says that after Lot left, God spoke to Abraham. You don't want God talking when you leave. My <laughs> <laughs> right. goodness, let's not do that. <laughs> so we could stay on that a whole sermon, but we can't because we need to move along. So th just know this. Go home and remedy anything that's not love. Get it straight. Get it straight. Because if you need that place to prosper, that's where love is going to have to be the most prevalent. Yeah. The second thing that qualifies you, or we could say this disqualifies you, for prosperity, your pastor quoted it earlier. Let's go over to 3 John. 3 John. You see, yesterday we were shouting about right. what was being taught, and rightly so, we should be. But now we need to now we need to say some things so we can keep shouting. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, to qualify for Bible prosperity, number one, walk in love, and at all costs. Now, look look what Abraham did. When it came to his relative, his brother, his nephew, is his nephew, but he's his, his brother, spiritually, he preferred his brother. But when enemy kings came and carried off Lot and his family, when they attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and the enemy kings came and carried him off, Abraham had, a, had his own private army, over 200 men fully armed and went after him and defeated him and came back with the spoils. Notice, when it came to his brethren, he let him have the first choice, and when it came to his enemy, he took it all. Yeah. There's a difference. If they're your brother, you give him preference. If they're your enemy, take it all. All. Why? Because the wealth of the sinner going to end up in the hands of the just. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm just talking about if you're going to attack me, if you're, if, and that's exactly what he did. He went after Abraham's kinfolk. He said, when you touch him, you touch me. So come on, let's go. So this was no weak man when he gave over to Lot, was it? This was a man who knew where strength was to be used. And it wasn't against his brother. It was against his enemy. You don't fight your brethren. You don't fight your brethren. You don't fight your brethren over money. If you fight your brethren over money, you're not ready for it yet. You're not big enough for it yet. <clears throat> Third John verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things thou mayest what? Look at this. Prosper. And be in health. Because money without health is really... 
you're, you're, you're cheated. Yeah. May us prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper or to the degree that your soul prospers. Uh, here, John calls it the soul prospering. And he, uh, in Romans 12, Paul called it the renewing of the mind. In Psalm 23, David called it the restoring of the soul. It's all the same. It's all the same, just different terminology because of different writers. But they're all saying the same thing. So here he said, uh, Beloved, I wish. Now, we know that John's holding the pen, but we know this. They were being the secretaries to the Holy Ghost. Right, weren't they? Because everyone who penned the New Testament were writing as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. That's what the Word says. They were being moved upon by the Holy Ghost. So really, John was penning what the Holy Ghost was saying. Beloved, I wish. Above all things. So this wasn't just John's desire for these people. This was, the, this was God's desire. God's desire. Now notice, the desire for your prosperity didn't begin with you. It began with God. You think you desire prosperity. He desires it more for you than you ever did because it began with Him. The desire for it began with Him. Amen. Beloved, I wish above all things thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. So the second thing to qualifying to having, to live, it, to live as rich as you are is you're going to have to renew your mind. You're going to have to. And it's a joyous work. It's a wonderful work, this process of renewing the mind, because uh, prosperity is not how much you have. Prosperity is about a mentality. Listen, it doesn't matter how much money you have, because if you think broke, you're not prosperous. My dad being a cotton and wheat farmer, and my dad ended up doing very well for himself financially. Of course, he, he, he worked many, 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 many long hours, many long years before he got to a place where he was flourishing financially. But there were farmers. I mean, some had bigger, you know, uh, greater, greater amounts of acreage, and there were some who had massive farms. And uh, it was funny because Ed would go, when we went to Altus, Oklahoma, where, where my parents lived, Ed would go to the cafe, you know, where farmers go, because farmers aren't really farmers if they don't have a cafe. That's, that's just, <laughs> it's not just you got to have a farm, you got to have a cafe where the farmers gather. So they sit and swap stories, you know, and it's always hard luck stories. Always hard luck stories. Oh, uh, Ed went with Daddy, you know, once and not once, but several occasions. And so they were sitting there, and they, they always got a sad story. Oh, my gosh. You know, I got held out. You know, the hell got my cotton. And, you know, oh my gosh, the Johnson grass is just eating me up. You know, and they talk about how much money they're lost and how much money they're not going to make. And they just revel in that. They just revel in it. And so uh, after one particular conversation, these men got up and walked out and Daddy and Ed were left. And, and Daddy said to Ed, said, well, see that guy that was sitting by you, he, he, he's worth $14 million. I mean... That guy over there, he has 20, $27 million, you know. He said, because even though they had money, they were broke. Wow. Up here. They talked broke, they thought broke, and they acted broke. Right. Prosperity is not what you possess, it's a mentality. It's a mentality. And if you're not rich in the way you think, it'll never show up in your pocketbook. I'm talking about the God kind of rich. It's a mentality. And when you struggle, when you don't have your mind renewed, you're cheap. You're cheap. You're not generous. You see, cheap with your, cheap with child, cheap with your children, you know. Just give them, a, give them a tongue lashing every time they ask for something, you know. And, you know, and, and if you're cheap, uh, you're, you're, I don't, you don't care how many times you say I'm rich. You're not rich till this changes. Amen. Amen. To think limitedly is to put a ceiling on your prosperity. You're going to have to take the wrong thinking off so you can get the ceiling off of how you think. Amen. God told me one morning when I woke up a couple years ago, he said this to me. He said, one of the greatest enemies to your prosperity is your past. 
And I knew what he meant, the struggles you saw as a child, the words you heard as a child, the, the struggles you saw your parents or your grandparents or never having enough, and you heard those conversations, and they talked about the problems, and, and those words get in you, and they start determining for you what you'll reach for. You won't even reach for things. You won't even reach for things because you've already been talked out of them before you even reached adulthood many times. You see, the word, will, the word will undo that, but it's a work. You have to let that work happen. You have to be a part of that work. Amen. The only thing that will change that is the word. Amen. Now, listen, there are seasons in your life when you make sacrifices, but that's not your life. That's a season. So don't let seasons determine what you can have. Amen. So, the way you think will show up in the way you talk, we, in the way you act. We can tell how you think by, my gosh, the pastor's taking two offerings on Sunday. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah? Renew your mind right there. Yeah. There's your, right. renew Amen. your mind. Renew Amen. your mind. Yeah. yeah. If your talk hasn't changed, your thinking hasn't changed, you know. Right. How do you renew your mind? You've got to get the word in you yourself you've got to confess it but your mind is not renewed until you're doing it you not the renewing of the mind just believing that pastor said it and that what he said is true is not the renewing of the mind just you're agreeing with it is not the renewing of the mind until you're doing it your mind's not renewed so make sure that you're doing what you are saying amen to amen amen, amen. For faith to work right, you have to talk right. You have to think right. So you cannot bypass this joyous, wonderful thing, the renewing of the mind. Uh, aren't you glad that what belongs to you in Christ is a different way of thinking? Oh, my gosh. That is so valuable. I don't have to think the way I used to think anymore. That is such a in him benefit. Now, I'm going to make the next point of qualifying for prosperity because people would think that, well, that's a given, but this is where so many miss it. To qualify for Bible prosperity, you have to use your faith. Not just have faith, you've got to use your faith. That's right. Just because you believe something doesn't mean it's going to show up. You're going to have to actively use your faith. This is why many don't have a flow of prosperity. They're, they're not using their faith. They have faith, but they're not using it. Listen, faith comes by hearing. Right? Faith comes by hearing. Faith does not operate by hearing. Faith does not go into operation right. because you heard it. That's right. That's right. Faith comes by hearing, but faith operates by saying and acting. That's right. And just having faith does not mean you're prosperous. If you're not using it, if you're not saying it, and if you're not acting in line with it, you're not using your faith. That's right. Amen. Amen. And without using your faith, you're not going to prosper. There was a man who came up to Dad Hagen and said uh, years ago when he was in one of Dad Hagen's churches that he pastored, he said, now, Brother Hagen, he says, I've been tithing for a certain, you know, a year and a half or whatever. And he says, if my finances have ever changed because of that, I can't tell it. Brother Hagen said, it's not about just giving your tithe, brother. You have to use your faith. You can't just be a bucket plunker and not use your faith. <laughs> People think that if I pay, you know, just paying it off, that's like a paying off the mafia lord or something. You can't just put it in and think, you, okay, I paid him off. No, you got to use your faith. We're not trying to just pay God off so that nothing bad happens to us. He's not a mafia lord. That's what mafia, you know, they wring it out of you so that, so that your business is still here in the morning. No, you've got to use your faith. 
I mean, there, there's some things I've heard about, I, I, I've just heard about them, that some, some pastors are giving their congregations the challenge. Over the next 90 days, if you'll tithe for the next 90 days, and if your finances don't change because of that, we'll give you your money back. Wow. I'm not giving your money back. <laughs> I don't know what scripture they're basing that on. They're saying prove, I'm sure they're saying prove God. But the thing is, it's going to prove you. Because you can put money in on the next 90 days and not release an ounce of faith, and you're not getting diddle. If you're going to prosper, you're going to have to use your faith. This is just not going to fall on you. You've got to get up every day and declare some things and hold fast and fight the good fight of faith. This is not just an automatic you know, thing like you just pull the, the, the lotto le- lever in your life. You've got to, you've got to use your faith. God has, God has taken care of this ministry all these years. He's taken care of it. But when Ed died, I can see in a more personal, intimate way how he's taking care of things because it's real up front to me. It was, it was up front to Ed, but now it's real up front to me, so I preach it different now. <laughs> Right? I got a front row seat on this thing. And I have gotten up every day from the time Ed went home. And I had my confessions before, but I mean especially, my God shall supply. I'm living off the top of the barrel. I'm using my faith. And this is where so many people that are rich are missing it. They're not using their faith. They're not using it. And you have to use it when it looks like it's not working. You have to use it when it looks like it's working. You know, Paul says, I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. People, a lot of people say, well, I know how to be a base, brother. I've been a base all my life. No, there's a lot of people who don't know how. Because Paul said, I know how to be a base. In other ways, in other words, when a lot of people are base or when they don't have enough, they gripe, they complain. They don't know how to be a base. And then he says, I know how to abound. There's a lot of people who say, well, I know how, to, I'd, I'd, do, I'd be good too if I knew how to, you know, if I had more than enough, I'd do good too, just like Paul. No, no, no. There's a lot of people when they have more than enough, they quit coming to church, they quit using their faith, they quit. There's a lot of people who don't know how to be a base and they don't know how to abound. What do we, what do we know about Paul? He says, I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. What is it? I have strength for all things. I'm strong in all of it. Whether I'm a base or whether I'm a bound, I'm the same. I'm strong in all of it because my strength's in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm strong when I'm a base. I'm strong when I'm a bound. I'm the same. How come? Because he's in faith all the time. All the time. Every day you're going to have to use your faith. Faith is not something that you just visit once, a, once every three months. It's a lifestyle. It's the way we live. The just shall live by faith. And I tell you what, if you're not living by faith, you're not really living. And only the just can live by faith. The unjust can't live by faith. So the third thing is use your faith. <laughs> Amen? Now, uh, you can know about prosperity, but it's not going to become yours until you use your faith. And I, you know what? You just can't use your wife's faith neither. Or your husband's faith. You need to have your own faith. What about with the day Ed went home with the Lord if I didn't have my own faith? I'd be in trouble. The ministry would be in trouble. The congregation would be in trouble. If you don't have your own faith, it's not just you that's in trouble. It's everyone connected to you that's in trouble. So don't get this attitude that, you know, my wife, she does all the confessing and all the praying. You better, you better stop that business because that, that's broke thinking right there. That, that'll, that'll end you up broke real quick. Now, remember, Dad Hagen gave us, because these are steps God gave him about, about prosperity, how God taught me about prosperity. Do you know those four steps? Step number one, God, Jesus told him. Because Brother Hagen was praying for money all the time. And he says, why are you talking to me about money? He says, I don't have any American currency up here. <laughs> and he says, I can't rain it down. He says, what you need is on the earth. Right. He said, so don't pray the way you've been praying about money anymore. Because he is praying, asking God to give it to him. 
And God and, and Jesus gave him these four steps. He says, number one, claim how much you need. Claim it. Why? You have authority. That's right. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he's given to the children of men. Amen. Belongs to you. Amen. 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 So number one, claim how much you need. Number two, tell Satan to take his hands off of it. Why? Because he's the God of this world. And so he's trying to hinder and he's trying to hold it back. So number two, you tell Satan to take your hands off that mace. So if you need $10,000, say, I claim $10,000. See, it's already in the earth. Yeah. Yeah. You're not yeah. having to claim it from God because he's not withholding it from you. That's right. That's right. I claim the money I need to come in Jesus' name. $10,000, you come. Now, Satan, you take your hands off of it. Why? Because he's the God of this world. He's going to try to interrupt that flow. That's right. That's right. He's going to try to stop that from coming to you. So you tell him to take his hands off of it. Right. And then number three, tell the angels to go and get it. Now, why do you need the angels to go and get it? Well, if this were the money, if, the, if this right here was the, represented the money I need, this was $10,000, and Satan, uh, I, sell, I say, I claim $10,000, and Satan, you take your hands off the $10,000 that belongs to me, his hands go off of it. Yeah. But what he's not doing is delivering it to me. Yeah. <laughs> take his hands off of it. So I don't even know where it fell. I don't even know who or the reason. I don't even know the avenue. I don't even know the avenue. When he took what he take his hands off, I don't even know where it's at. I don't know who, who God was using. I don't know. I don't know. Now you tell the angels, go. Go get it. Now they know where it is, so they go and get it. And they bring it to you. They bring you customers. They bring you job opportunities. Whatever they... Wherever, wherever the, the enemy took his hand off of it, those angels know. They see in the spirit realm. So he says, you tell the angels to go and cause the money to come. Cause the money to come. Cause the money to come. And then number four, this is the big step. Because, see, it only takes about a few seconds to do step number one, step number two, and step number three. But the rest of the time is step number four. Praise God till it shows up. And that's where you're either going to fail or falter. You're going to succeed or falter, rather. Is how, well, I've been I've been doing that for three weeks. Well, you better keep doing it, because your faith of praise, because really praise is the highest expression of faith. Your praise is the fuel the angels work on, and they're working to bring that money to you. And if you stop praising, they had no more fuel. Why? Because if your faith stops, they have to stop. They only can operate as long as your faith is operating. If your faith stops operating, they have to stop operating. Because it's your faith that gives them permission to work for you. You understand that? Angels need, you thought, well, I thought they're working for God. No, they're working for you. God assigned them to you. And if your faith works, then they keep working. If your faith stops working, they have to cease working. So uh, number one is what? Claim how much you need. Number two is what? Tell Satan, take Satan, take your hands off of it. Number three? Tell the, tell the angels, go and bring it. You know where it's at. And then what you're going to do? Yeah, till it shows up. Till it shows up. Till it shows up. Well, where's the money coming from? That, that's not your business. That's why you need angels. That's angel work. That's not your work. Get off angel work. You know angel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Now, are you, are you still with me? I know I've been up here an hour now. Okay, number four, because I only got five, so hold on. You know, you're, we're, we're getting near the end here. Well, first, what was the first step? Walking up. Number two is what? Renew your mind. Number three is what? Use your faith. Number four, obey God's plan for your life. God's not funding disobedience. Rich won't work for disobedience. Remember what the word says? Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. So uh, it's not just about starting, it's about finishing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I started going to church years ago, but, you know, I feel it doesn't matter. If you didn't finish, you didn't, you didn't do the will of God. That's right. 
Starters are dime a dozen. Finishers are one in a million. I'm just telling you. And uh, I have a book. I don't, I don't think. Yeah, it is back there called God the Revealer's Secrets. Yes. Teaching you about how to know the will of God for your life. That's what that book's about. And in that book that came out of something that God, Jesus said to me one day. He said, make my people to know that long life is connected to my plan. If they're going to veer from long life, if they're going to veer from my plan, they're going to veer from long life. He said, if they're going to veer from my plan, they're going to veer from prosperity. See, in his plan is where all these good things are. That's where they lie. And if, you're, if you don't care about his plan, then you're veering away from what all these things that his plan hold for you. In his plan is health. In his plan is joy and peace. And in his plan is provision. But if you don't care about his plan and you go, I'm going to do my own thing, then you have to give up these other things that are connected to his plan. So it's not a light thing to just say, I'm going to do what I want to do. Because you don't realize what all you're, you're bypassing. And if you come back to his plan, you can have all those things. I don't care how long you've been out of the will of God. If you come back, you, those things are still attached. You can still have it. You can still have it. So don't let the devil tell you you've gone too far. It, it, as long as you've got air in your lungs, you haven't gone too far. You can always come back to the plan of God. You can always come back to the plan of God. Amen? So you have to obey. Now, we talk about the plan of God for your personal life. You have to fulfill the plan of God for your personal life. What's he telling you to do? But what about his general plan? What about his, gen his general plan is that you build up He's building, the, he's building the, the, the church. What's God interested in? What's his plan? It's the local church. It's the church. And if you don't care anything about the church, you don't care about his plan. Come on. That's good. That's right. Because his plan is the, church, the body of Christ. Yes. So if you want to really prosper, you have to be involved in his plan for the body of Christ. Right. That means you're funding it. That means you're serving in it. That means you're praying. That means yeah. you're, you're bringing all you should be bringing to the body of Christ. And when you do, it's going, you're going to prosper. But you can't call yourself rich and not care about your local church. You can't do it. You can't say, bless God, I'm rich. And you don't, even, you don't, you, you don't tithe or give offerings faithfully. You, know, you can't do it because you're out of the will of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Without holiness... No man will see the Lord. Isn't that right? Well, how many of you know a man who's holy is doing the will of God with joy? That's what holiness is, doing the will of God with joy. That's what holiness is. Holiness is not the way you hold your hands when you pray. <laughs> holiness is not how low you bow. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's, it's good and right to reverence God, and you want to kneel in the presence of God, but that's not holiness. Holiness is how you live. Holiness is doing His will and glad to be doing it. Doing the will of God with joy. The, the willing and the obedient shall what? Eat the good of the land. He's telling you, if you like my will and you're glad to do my will, you're going to eat the good. If you gripe about my will, you're not going to eat the good. Disobedient to the, to the will of God, you're, you're, you're not going to eat the good of the land. The, the land may eat you good. May eat you real good. Amen. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Well, if prosperity is of the Lord, well, that's one way you see him is when you prosper, that's one way he's showing up in your life. His help, his, his assistance, all these things. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, let's hit the fifth one, then we'll, then we'll go on to the next thing. Qualify for Bible prosperity, you have to have right motives and a right heart. If you're going to be messed up in your intent and your motives, you're not safe with increase because the increase will destroy you. You have to... I, I was sitting with, at breakfast one morning with Norval Hayes several years ago, and he said, there aren't many people that are big enough for big money. Now listen to that statement. What's he talking about? His, the insides of people. Yeah. Not big enough for big money. You've got to get your insides big enough yeah. for big money. 
How do you do that? Well, you renew your mind. You obey the will of God. You walk in love. All these things that we talk about, they make your insides bigger. Smith Wigglesworth said, I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. That's why he had the fruit that he, his ministry in life produced, because he's big inside. You see, people who fuss and get in strife over money, you just show yourself you're not big enough yet. Every time you fight, you're showing God, I'm not big enough for big money. Every time I throw a temper tantrum, every time I get offended, every time I get into unforgiveness or bitterness, I'm showing God I'm not big enough yet. Don't you do that with your children? You see these little kids and they say, Mama, I want this. No, no, baby, we're not going to get that today. And they throw, they throw themselves on the ground. Oh, for sure you're not getting that today. <laughs> Let me tell you what else you're getting. When we get home, you're getting something. Right? Because they show themselves not ready because of the way they responded. The way you respond to people and circumstances show whether or not you're big enough inside for big money yet. If you talk bad about your boss, you're not big enough for big money. You're not big enough. If you jump in with co-workers co co and start criticizing other co-workers, you're showing God I'm not big enough. You, you're, you're, you're dwarfing your own spirit every time you do something against what pleases God. I tell you, you can't sit in bad mouth grandmama, sit in bad mouth relatives at home and then think you're going to say, Oh God, I I'm rich in Christ. Not going to work. Why? Remember what Jesus said at, at Lazarus' tomb? Father, I thank you hear, that you hear me while I'm at the tomb. And you hear me always. He heard him not just at the tomb. He heard him before he got to the tomb. God doesn't just hear you when you pray for money. He heard you before you asked for money. He heard you when you were talking about the boss at the lunch, the lunch room. You see? And that's why you go to make faith confessions. It doesn't work because you've already spoken other things that are contrary to it. Praise the Lord. When you talk hateful to your spouse, you show God you're not ready. You're not big enough yet. Not big enough. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Ed and I have paid out um, we have paid out around $300,000 in money we did not owe. Just to keep peace. Understand? Just to keep peace. I show God I'd rather have peace. Because in peace, finances can flow. In strife, no money, nobody's getting any. And there, there, there have been times that God has asked me to do a certain thing financially that I didn't have to do. But I knew that if I failed that, instruction. I knew he, he's going to see whether I'm big enough. If I'm going to hold on to that, that big chunk of money and not do what peace would do, then I, I disqualify myself for more than what I'm holding. You see, you have to know this. When God sees that you'll give up money just to keep peace with your brethren, He'll say you're big enough. Yeah. Now, can I tell you what's not big? That what won't make you big? These get-rich-quick schemes. Yeah. You, you get away from that mess. The Bible speaks against those. It said, wealth gotten in haste will be a man's ruin. Why? Because God's not getting anybody rich in haste. He's, he's increasing them little by little. Why? As their own spirit is able to receive it and, and support that increase. God wants you to increase, but you can't go faster than grace can take you. Grace can only take you at a certain pace. It depends on how obedient you are and the quality of your own spirit. Amen? So when we start a building program, we have to make sure we got all the strife out of the house. You understand? When your, your family's wanting to contribute to the building program, honey, make sure there's no strife, no... no we got to get that out because we, we need to pay what we, what we want to give to toward that. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> See, Abraham understood this when he told Lot, if you want the land of the right, I'll go to the left. You want the land of the left, I'll go to the right. Why, did he why could he do that? Because he said, the blessing isn't with the land, the blessing is with me. 
Where I am is the blessing. And where I go, the land starts behaving like the blessing. See, that's why if, if you'll fight over money, you don't realize the blessing's with you. It's not with the money. It's with you. And when you, sh- when you fight over money, you show God, I don't even know that the blessing's with me. I'm showing people. I'm showing God. I don't, I don't know that. Uh, then, then let let me let me uh, bring this out. Listen, money is nothing but a tool. Yeah. Money is nothing but a tool. Don't do not make it your Lord. Never make something your Lord that's not big enough to deliver you. Your salary not big enough to deliver you. Your income's not big enough to deliver you. It only takes one little economy change to show that. What you're serving, you better make sure it's big enough to deliver you. And money is a poor Lord because it's nothing but a tool. You know, a carpenter has many tools, right? Has a hammer, has a saw, screwdrivers, all kinds of things. Would he ever say, oh, hammer, oh, hammer, what should I do with my life today? (laughs) You don't take counsel from a tool, stupid person. You go hammer a nail in with that thing. Yet there are people who say money, money. Where do I go? Who do I love? What do I support? And they're asking counsel from nothing but a tool. If we saw a carpenter out talking to his hammer, brother, I'd say that boy needs more than a carpenter job. He needs like a, he needs a mental checkup. There are people that are serving a tool. Listen, your motive for prosperity has to be right. Your motive for prosperity has to be a bl- to be a blessing. Yeah. Remember what he told Abraham? I blessed you so you can be a blessing. Yeah. I'm not blessed you so that you can hoard it all and make sure nobody else right. gets any of it. Yeah. Right. If you're not going to be generous, you don't qualify for Bible prosperity. Yeah. Right. You have to be big enough to you have to be big enough to bring someone else on, in on that prosperity. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Remember, it is the Lord thy God that giveth thee power to get yeah. wealth, is what Deuteronomy yeah. says. But actually, the, the original says, it is, it is, remember, it is the Lord thy God who giveth thee the power to produce wealth. Yeah. Why? Because if you're producing it, you're bringing somebody else in on it. Yeah. It's not just about you acquiring it. It's about you blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right. Amen. Right. Now, now, and I'm going to tell you something else, too. This is what you, you need to understand about money. It's not money that, prove, that, gets you, uh, uh, that qualifies you or gets you ready to handle money. Joseph, remember his brothers, his precious brothers. <laughs> <laughs> sold him into slavery. Sold him. Sold him. The last thing he hears out of his brothers is sold. It's the last thing he hears. These traveling caravan came, bought him. Brother says, sold, take him. Took him into Egypt. And he served under Potiphar. The Bible says that Joseph, under Potiphar, was a prosperous man because the Lord was with him. Didn't say he was prosperous because he had any money. He's a slave. He doesn't have any money. He's about a 17-year-old kid. He was out working for his daddy. He's not, he didn't have any money. So here he worked up for his dad. He didn't have any money. didn't have a banking account. He gets sold to Potiphar. He doesn't have any money. He's a slave. He's not, he doesn't have a banking account, but God said he's prospered. That's right. Why? His insides. That's right. His insides. What's yeah. he's got in him? Yeah. Something in him. God and it says God was with him. And then uh, he serves Potiphar faithfully and gets accused wrongfully, thrown in prison for 12 years. You think prisoners have bank accounts? <laughs> not the last, No. They don't have bank accounts. So after 12 years, now listen, he could have been down there festering over his brothers, festering over Potiphar's wife, all these people that had done him wrong. For 12 years, he was by himself long enough in prison for the devil to work on him and work on him, and he wouldn't be worked on. He kept his insides right. He kept his insides clean. For all that time against yeah. all the yeah. wrong done to him. Right. Listen, people are going to do you wrong. That's no right. excuse for you to be wrong. Right. That's right. That's right. Come on. 
Everybody gets done wrong. Everybody at some level, at some place. And I'm not trying to make light of it. But once you belong to Christ, you have an exit out of that wrongdoing. You don't have to be the, the baggage carrier for it. So Joseph, for over 12 years, he's keeping himself, his insides clean. Keeping himself right. What? His insides are getting bigger. His... Really, can you be in a bad place, really the wrong place that someone else put you in? For over 12 years, he was in a place of not his own choosing. Someone else put him there. And they were difficult places. They were hard places. So, as a shepherd boy working for his daddy, he doesn't have any money. Potiphar, a slave working for him, doesn't have any money. A prisoner, he doesn't have any money. One, one, night, one morning, uh, well, he wakes up in the prison. But that night, he goes to bed, and he's second in command in a nation. In one day. In one day. One day. You understand? In one day. Why? Because his insides, his motives, his heart. I don't care how long you've been struggling and difficulty, God can turn it around in an instant if you keep your insides right and you keep your motives right and you keep your heart right. When people are doing you wrong, that's not a license and permission for you to be wrong in the eyes of God. He won't, let, he won't allow that. So he wakes up a prisoner, goes to bed second in command. And he goes to bed running the economy of the, one of the greatest nations on the earth. He's running the economy. And he's never had a banking account of his own, never had money of his own. Why is he safe to run Pharaoh's money? Because he's not trying to get his own. He's safe with another man's wealth. If you're not safe with another man's wealth, you're not ready for wealth. You watch out for your boss's company. You don't sit and talk on the phone on your boss's time. You're stealing his wealth. He hired you for a full day of work, and it's not so you could sit and text your girlfriend. You're stealing. When I'm on the job, he paid for me from 8 to 5 or whatever those hours are. If you're going to steal from your boss, you're showing God I'm not ready for big money of my own. And so he was safe with running the economy of a nation because he hadn't had any of his own to begin with. And now he gets to partake of great wealth, doesn't he? Now he gets to partake. Notice, God did not use money to prepare him to handle money. God used everyday circumstances. How he handled everyday attitudes, everyday circumstances, everyday problems to prove him whether he'd be ready for money or not. That's right. That's real good. How you're handling everyday circumstances show whether or not you're ready for rich. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's the truth, isn't it? So what are these five things? Walk in love. Walk in love. You mind? Use your faith. Use your faith. Obey God's plan. For Obey God's plan for your private life and for the body of Christ. And then the fifth one? Right motives and right heart. Yeah. Then your way. If you'll get all these, you're well on your way. Amen? And you know what? You can make a decision today. All these are going to be, right now, they're in place for me. Right now. You don't have to try to achieve this. This is what I am right now. This is the way I'm going to be right now. I don't care where I've messed up in the past. I make that change right now. I qualify in all this right now. It's by choice. It's a choice. It's not a journey to get there. It's a choice I make. I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to renew my mind. I'm, that's what you're doing in church tonight, right? You're renewing your mind. Yeah, and keeping your motive right. All that kind of stuff. Right now, my motive is right. Right now. Right now. Amen. I'm not going to hurt my brother just so I can get an increase. Not going to do it. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Stand with me to your feet tonight. Father, we thank you.